be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus told the disciples a parable. Can a blind person act as guide to another who is blind? Will they not both fall into a ditch? The student is not above the teacher, but all students will, once they are fully trained, be on a par with the teacher. How can you look at the splinter in another's eye when you miss the plank in your own? How can you say to another that we remove the splinter from your eye, yet fail yourself to see the board lodged in your own? Hypocrite. Remove the board from your own eye first, then you will see clearly enough to remove the speck from the eye of another. A good tree does not produce bad fruit any more than a bad tree produces good fruit. Each tree is known by its yield. Figs are not taken from thorn bushes or grapes picked from briars. Good people produce goodness from the good they have stored up in their hearts. Evil people produce evil from the evil stored up in their hearts. People speak from the fullness of their hearts. The good news of salvation. Good evening. In the first reading, we hear just as the potter's work is tested in the kiln, so too are we tested when we open our mouths. In the first word of the gospel, can a blind person act as a guide to another who is blind? Will they not both fall into a ditch? So the Holy Spirit says to me, so where are you going to lead us tonight? The first words of the gospel, right? I am not so blind as to my own blindness that I don't feel this uh, trembling, even a bit of terrifying introduction. Where are you going to take us, Lord? A thought crossed my mind that a, parallel, a prudent response might be to invite us all to take a few moments of silent reflection on our own possible blindness and what we would do to remove it. But our world and our country and our church are in such turmoil that I choose, I hope not foolishly, to say something albeit briefly. This week saw the biggest invasion of a sovereign country since World War II. Millions are on the move, literally having lost everything. We will have refugees for months, if not years. Most of us are overwhelmed with what to do. Tonight's gospel in its ending talks of good trees producing good fruit. In Galatians, St. Paul lists the fruits of a life lived in the spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I think it would be good this week if we could go to that Galatians chapter and ponder these gifts. And I suggest each of us contemplate this list and dissect which fruit are you strongest in? 
and plan how to best use that gift for others. Do not dwell on what you are deficient in. For many of us, that would take us the rest of our lives and we would accomplish nothing. But God needs us now. And each of us has some gift. So find out what yours is and, and contemplate and meditate on how you can best use that for others. And we all have some, like the little drummer boy or little drummer girl. Each of us has a drum that we can play. Take that gift, use it, grow it. There is a theology that says that when you take one virtue and you accomplish it in its fullness, you somehow get all the others. If you're generous and you use that, you find yourself more loving, more kind, etc. So take that one and work on it. Secondly, and also with some trepidation, I would like to comment on the recent report about baptism in the Diocese of Phoenix. For those of you who are not familiar with this, a few weeks ago it was reported that the diocese inspected the practice of a particular pastor, Reverend Andres Arango, where he used we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, instead of I, Bless, bless you, baptize you. Instead of then taking that information and asking the priest to conform to the more regular and accepted I, the diocese decided that in fact, all of his baptisms, and he was there 17 years, were invalid. And so the pastor resigned. But when I Googled it yesterday, looking for a comment, I found that he, on a Friday in the Phoenix Sun, was told that his job was to rebaptize those thousands. And so he was doing the do-overs, as they said. But of course, when you redo the baptism, then it follows on that line of reasoning, if reasoning is a word that you could associate with that, you have to redo the communion and you have to redo the confirmation. And since it was 17 years, we we'll have to redo the marriages. And in two instances, according to the Times story a couple of weeks ago, there were priests. We have to redo the ordination and redo the marriages of all that they married when they were priests, et cetera, et cetera. As troubling as I found this, the ensuing weeks since it was first disclosed, I found more troubling the lack of comment in church circles. Silence, the legal societies say, means consent. When I was arguing or complaining to the Holy Spirit about this, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, who is sometimes a nudge, sort of said, uh, 
Are you in the pulpit this Sunday? Oh, so I decided to use this pulpit you have graced me with to, as John Lewis said, say something. Lay Catholics have spoken out in print. In one letter to the New York Times, a lay person said, of all the issues, errors, and actual criminal crimes forcing the church, facing the church, the fact that this receives more than a fleeting glance from church leaders is incredible. The suggestion that all of the baptisms performed by Father Arango are invalid is absolutely absurd. She goes on to say, do they really believe Jesus would exclude all those individuals from eternal life? Absurd, yes, and unjust to this priest who faithfully served his congregation for 17 years. And his final mass before, after his resignation, the church was packed. At the end of the service, he received a standing ovation. So spoke the people of God. And most disturbing on all of this to me is the image of God that is, this action projects. We know our God as loving, compassionate, forgiving, kind, etc. Here he is presented, or she is presented, as an obsessive compulsive Pharisee. <laughs> God forbid we'd all be in trouble. And they will say, we don't understand because we don't know sacramental theology. Well, I don't know sacramental theology, but it reminds me of the fable of the king and the clothes. You had to have a particularly set mind to understand that the king was wearing clothes. Thank God for the little boy who said, but he's naked. So they to us say, oh, you don't understand because you don't know sacramental theology. Well, I don't, but I still know you're wrong. And so we pray with and for Father Arango that he will find the grace to say the words of our Savior at his crucifixion. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, and they know not what they do. And we pray that Jesus and our God will provide them with the mind of Jesus so they can lead this church properly. And finally, we also pray that Father Arango will hear the words of God, once again, words that were pronounced at the most famous baptism in our history, and hear them directed at him. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Maybe hear that and find peace. Amen. Amen.